Thin Men tonight. Australia is a lucky country. Recently, we've luxuriated in long and expensive legal cases over such trivial matters as a football star's private parts. But just to the north of Australia, there's an extraordinary legal case going on that has been likened to the Stalinist political show trials of the 1950s. Accused is Janana Guzmao, the Timorese freedom fighter or terrorist, depending on whose side you're on. <laughs> From his jungle hideout, Janana Guzmao tells how his people have to wait years to get enough money to buy a blanket and can't afford to send their children to school. Sound familiar? But this is East Timor, where Guzmao has been a sort of scarlet pimpernel, a folk hero who's eluded capture for more than a decade. He and his motley band of rebels have held out in the hills and valleys and jungles of East Timor for 17 years now. So it came as something of a surprise to his supporters and the world at large when he was captured by the Indonesians and confessed to the error of his ways even before his trial. Shanana was tortured psychologically and uh, physically with electric shock and the drugs. I showed the video, uh, which the Indonesians themselves did, to a group of five UN experts on torture and detention. And they all concluded that, yes, that man was subjected to horrib horrible uh, torture. Jose Ramos Horta is a former Timorese freedom fighter himself who spent the past 17 years in exile roaming the international stage seeking support for his people. This council must call upon the government of Indonesia to withdraw immediately. And Next week he'll be speaking once again at the United Nations in Geneva about the plight of Janana Guzmao. Senator Evans, are you totally satisfied that the Fretland leader, Janana Guzmao, hasn't been tortured before his trial by the Indonesians? We simply have no evidence that would suggest that that has been the case. There's been speculation about that by some Fretland supporters. Shanana Guzman's sister, for instance, was raped in front of her husband. They pulled her pubic hairs, extracted her pubic hairs. Another woman, a uh, prisoner, had her toenails extracted. But as they rape and torture his uh, sister, as uh, they rape and torture other women that were captured on that day, they would dutifully inform him that because of you, this is happening to uh, your relatives. The details of what has happened to Guzmao himself, even the circumstances of his capture, are sketchy. While he hasn't been able to choose his own lawyer for his two-month-long trial, he has been visited by Red Cross representatives. He's also spoken briefly to foreign journalists. Have you been treated fairly by the Indonesian authorities? Yes. Any problem? No. But according to the chairman of the support group called the East Timor Foundation, some aspects of the Guzmao trial proceedings have been alarming. He apparently made a very brief statement at the end of an interview with Portuguese journalists uh, saying to them, please wait to the end of the trial, uh, don't leave beforehand. Uh, he was apparently uh, led into the courtroom into the next session with his uh, face covered up, so that the belief there is that he was uh, subjected to torture after that statement. Last week, Guzmao went back to his cell after the court was adjourned when a witness stood up and shouted, long live East Timor. The witness was declared insane. Guzmao himself shocked his supporters early in the trial by initially declaring that he was in fact Indonesian. He's also reported to have confessed to carrying arms when arrested. Shinana's behaviour has been erratic, but Horta believes it may all be part of a sophisticated stratagem. If he's in a normal state of mind, uh, he knows uh, very well how to address the court, how to battle in legal and political terms, although he's not a lawyer. Michael Wagner, however, is not so optimistic. While he believes the Indonesians do not want to create another dead martyr, 
they may be even more fearful of creating a living site. I believe that Shanana Guzmao is in grave danger. Uh, it may well be that uh, the Indonesian government uh, and particularly the military decide that uh, they have to execute him rather than creating a Nelson Mandela type figure uh, who will uh, be seen uh, as the leader of his country while he is in jail. Gareth Evans at the launch of his election policy trade package for Asia floated a more optimistic scenario. Can you understand why there's a degree of cynicism about this trial? It's being seen as a sort of Stalinist show trial of the 50s, where we see the man confess and recant, and then we have the trial. Well, there's all sorts of ways you can characterise these situations. Um, I don't think there's sufficient evidence to characterise it that way at this stage. What many people have been trying to do, including some prominent East Timorese, is to try and find a way of getting out of the violent confrontational mode that was proving so destructive and so sterile for so many years and moving beyond that uh, to a situation of reconciliation of these Timorese people uh, with Indonesia with accompanying respect for human rights, withdrawal of the military economic development and cultural recognition. As for the official Indonesian view, that's a much more difficult facade to crack. Very. Uh regretful on the victims on both sides. The Indonesians claim too that their own soldiers have been killed and tortured by the rebels. In an interview in the Australian newspaper, Indonesia's ambassador has appeared to have made some tantalising statements. Firstly that quote, we may have underestimated the ramifications of the Timor issue. And more ominously, that the Guzmao case would show that even with less arms, you can also provoke serious things. The big question in all of this is why would the Indonesians bother to put Guzmao on trial at all? What could they possibly hope to achieve by a political show trial, even if he were found guilty? Has he been tortured? Well, these are some of the questions I wanted to put to the Indonesian ambassador here in Canberra. But after 13 phone calls and three days, I was finally told that the ambassador was just too busy to speak with Inside Edition. What about next week, I said to the information officer. That doesn't look too promising either. No, he said, it doesn't. I had one more chance to interview the ambassador at Gareth Evans' policy launch. No, I don't say that this is not my press conference. But the question of Timor simply won't be waved away. As a defiant little monument outside the embassy shows, at least on Australian soil, hope can't be removed. After the break, we look at the events which led to tragedy in Timor. A galaxy of stars. See Timor from Australia, and yet we've turned a blind eye to the place throughout our history. In this second part of our special report on the trial of Janana Guzmao, we look at some of the events which led up to the tragedy of Timor today. It's never been easy for a journalist to tell the truth about Timor. Here's one who tried and was murdered for his pains. Why, they ask, are the Indonesians invading us? This is TV reporter Greg Shackleton's last piece to camera after the Indonesian invasion in 1975. Why, they ask, are the Australians not helping us? The next day, Shackleton and his four young media colleagues were brutally massacred. It's said that 200,000 people have died in Timor in the recent past. Not all of them, it has to be said, are victims of Indonesia, but most. Exterminate our people! You said worship to Kuwait! What about this Timor? Enough is enough! The Timorese argue that at least we have powerful friends we can talk to, and besides, we owe them one from way back. The real betrayals, they point out, started half a century ago. The Japs have no idea of the hot time coming to them, and here it comes. And then the Bungs go in for the kill with flaming spears and fire sticks. It's going to be hot today. Primitive warfare, inspired and guided by white men who have gone back to the primitive. Of uh, the family of my mother, there's only two survivors. My mother and uh, her sister, who is in Lisbon. The rest of the family were murdered uh, 
by the Japanese because they collaborate with uh, the Australians. That's why it uh, really pisses me off when uh, I see the Australian, uh, what Australian attitude in regard to the problem in Timor. Jose Ramos Horta is still bitter about what he considers has been the position of prominent Australians with regard to Timor. I can name the villains are Gough Whitlam, uh, Bill Hayden, Gareth Evans, one of the most activists in support of uh, Indonesia. He is very, very much, you know, in favor of human rights, like in Cambodia, or the further the better, you know, like in Guatemala. Gough Whitlam had left office, took a trip to the United States, to New York, only to speak on East Timor, to try to persuade the community, the UN community, to vote off East Timor from the agenda. Why? There's no question that Timor has become the Achilles heel of the Whitlam government's foreign policy record. During the Menzies years, there'd been the period of confrontation, open hostility between Australia and Indonesia. After two decades of liberal rule, the new Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, was suddenly into Bartik shirt diplomacy, climbing the temples of Borobudur with Indonesian strongman, President Suharto. Some, like Michael Wagner, argued that Australia turning a blind eye to Timor actually gave Indonesia its cue to strike. Whitlam has probably, even though he denies that, played a major role in giving Suharto the green light to take over East Timor. Um, Whitlam uh, has been very defensive over the years. Whenever approached on the matter of uh, Timor, uh, he has refused to admit any wrongdoing on his part. When I approached Gough Whitlam and told him that people interviewed in this program had been critical of his role in East Timor and invited him to respond, he told me he would not and that we would be hearing from his lawyers on the matter. Whether Australia was a catalyst in the invasion or not, one thing is certain. We didn't lift a finger when it was clear that it was about to happen. Jose, what's the situation? When did those ships come in? Uh, they start arriving uh, since Monday. Six, seven boats together, very close to our border. No, they are not there just for fun. You know? uh, they are preparing a massive operation. No, it certainly wasn't for fun. And after the invasion came purges, and then famine. Hundreds of thousands are said to have died. I grew up in the mountains of East Timor, in remote villages where no white man ever set foot. Those places, those villages that I knew, where I grew up, no longer exist. They were completely wiped out. I know of entire villages where not one single person is alive. Jose Gosmao, Janana's cousin, never got to Geneva or New York. Indeed, only to a street corner in Maroubra, Sydney, to protest outside the formidable-looking building which houses the Indonesian consulate. The footpath is a less influential forum than the UN, but at least we were listening. Well, this, I guess, is the difference between politics in Australia and the politics of our nearest neighbours. Here we are in the middle of a peaceful demonstration protesting for the freedom of East Timor. It's a lovely Saturday morning. But it was a lovely morning just like this on November 12, 1991 in Dili, which culminated in a hideous massacre which shocked the entire world. Tiananmen Square on our very doorstep. This footage of carnage as Indonesian soldiers descended on mourners at Santa Cruz Cemetery is nightmarish stuff. But the reality may be even more horrifying. It seems there may have been a number of massacres like this, but this is the only one captured on film and successfully smuggled out for the world to see. In Australia, which saw its last political bloodbath at Eureka Stockade 150 years ago, the image of a young man clinging for life before our very eyes was traumatic for millions. The Australian government, however, has officially exonerated the Indonesian government for the massacre. Had the situation been different, as we characterise it in 91, the Dili massacre, had we believed that that had been centrally directed by the Indonesian government in the way that the Tiananmen massacre had been clearly centrally directed by the Chinese government, had we believed that it was more than simply totally aberrant and indefensible behaviour by local military commanders, then I think our attitude and that of the rest of the world might well have changed. 
we'll probably never know all the diplomatic machinations behind the Timor takeover. However, in a now famous exchange, Dick Wolcott, the former ambassador to Indonesia, was asked about a cable he'd sent to Canberra in which he said, if and when Indonesia intervenes, act in a way designed to minimise the public impact in Australia and show privately understanding to Indonesia. Uh, uh, um, if possible, and I had uh, put comments like that into a cable, but this would be pretty late in the day, I think, from around about August or, uh, or later in 1975, when uh, it seemed to me, uh, my assessment, uh, and the embassy's assessment, not just my assessment, was that uh, Indonesian intervention was more or less inevitable now that a civil war had erupted and we had to look at what the long-term prospects were likely to be. Well, we made the judgment, for better or worse, as a nation, across party lines, back in the late 70s, reconfirmed in the early 80s, that there was no realistic prospect of that particular piece of history being unwound and that we could better assist the Timorese people in their aspirations for dignity, for security and cultural recognition uh, by working with the Indonesians rather than becoming some kind of posturing antipathy in Portugal. Reconciliation, does that still include the possibility of independence for the people of Timor? I don't think realistically it does anymore. That may have been an option in the mid-70s in the aftermath of what was and remains an indefensible exercise in annexation by the Indonesian government. But history has moved on and I don't think it's simply any longer a realistic option given a the attitude of the Indonesian government which sees this as a crucial test case of its capacity to hold together not only that province but indeed the whole of the archipelago given the number of different ethnic groups and potentially divisive tendencies there are and secondly the problem is the absence of any systematic willingness on the part of the international community uh, to really put the heat on if ever you wanted an illustration of the respective strengths of the two parties in this dispute, then it's here in Canberra. Behind me is the Indonesian embassy with all its ostentatious statuary. But just down the street here in the suburb of Yarralumla is the building which represents the political aspirations of Little East Timor, a pathetic demountable, almost a tent embassy. But in the long run, it won't be politicians who'll save the Timorese from being drowned in a sea of apathy. It'll be the people the Timorese themselves and their little crew of friends around the world. Some of them risked their lives to make a protest on the so-called peace ship, which sailed in protest into Indonesian waters like a sort of political Greenpeace. If the name Lusitania was ominously symbolic, then so was the name of one of those who signed on for what could easily have been a disastrous voyage. Her name was Shirley Shackleton wife of Greg Shackleton, who was massacred for simply trying to report the invasion in 1975. Whatever is going to happen, it's going to happen tomorrow. And it did. As helicopters buzzed overhead, the strain began to show on the captain's face. And as soon as the Lusitania Expresso crossed into Indonesian waters, the warships made their move. I tell you again, directly to leave this area. If you still continue your intention, I will do something to force you away from this area. Over. Yes, that's well understood, sir. I'm maneuvering, turning my ship, as you can well see. When the Lusitania Espresso was turned back by a threatening Indonesian commander, it was almost too much for Mrs Shackleton. But she gathered her strength for the homecoming to show some of that fighting spirit that has kept the Timorese and their friends keep on with a struggle that simply refuses to die. Yeah, I'm so glad I came along. We're out of danger now, I can say what bastards they are. Shirley Shackleton. Coming up, a story on the woman whose own famous daughter describes as America's most embarrassing mum. I was very proud of her photos and I hope that she can be proud of her mother. A respectable magistrate, a leading criminologist.